In this chapter, we are going to learn how to deal with the situation of when assumption of linear regression is not being met. So most popular approach for that is transforming outcome variable or independent variable. So we are talking about transformation. And then we are also going to talk about categorization of independent variable. And I don't recommend doing this, although many people do this. So I think it's important for you to know how to do categorization and how to interpret the result. And lastly, I will show how to perform nonlinear regression. Let's look at this example. Research funding and morbidity for 29 diseases. And y-axis is NIH research fund spent in a, in a particular year uh, for each disease. So for example, AIDS, $1.4 billion is spent uh, this year. And uh, breast cancer is about uh, $0.4 billion is spent. And x-axis is disability adjusted life years loss due to illness. So if you look at ischemic heart disease in nine million years uh, loss due to uh, ischemic heart disease. When we show association between NIH research fund and disability adjusted life years lost due to each illness and we can uh, provide evidence that NIH is uh, spending funds effectively to help people's, people to live longer. Okay. So this data involved two continuous variables. So analysis of choice is Pearson's correlation coefficient. And we know Pearson's correlation coefficient provide a p-value similar to simple linear regression. So if you do either of these analysis, p-value is 0.539, clearly not significant. And if you do, however, Spearman's coordination analysis, p-value is less than 0 0.0001, and this is, in fact, highly significant. And this is a result of linear regression. So each piece sign is actually the data points. Uh, so this is ACE, and this is ischemic heart disease. Uh, so as you see, the line is nearly flat. So if you do test, if you test if this line is zero or not, p-value is 0.539. So we couldn't really reject the null hypothesis and prove slope is not equal to zero. And r square is 0 0.01. So this means only one percent of NIH fund, one percent of variation in NIH fund is explained by adjusted life years lost due to illness. And if you do Spearman's correlation coefficient analysis, in Spearman's correlation, in fact, is 0.672. And if you square this, and R squared become 0.45. So that means 45% of variation of NIH research fund is explained by adjusted life years lost due to this illness and p-value is highly significant. And why discrepancy like this is happening? It's probably because assumptions of linear regression is not being met. So if you do diagnosis checking, uh, if you run the model diagnosis, and a histogram of residuals uh, looks like this. So this shows there are large cluster on the lower value. So uh, distribution is clearly not symmetric. So it's not normally distributed. And if you examine PP plots, and data points are not lining on diagonal line. So you see some patterns. And for lower uh, predicted value, lower value of, 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 along x-axis, and you have higher data points than um, diagonal line. Middle points is lower, and a higher uh, points is higher than diagonal line. So this indicates 
residuals are not normally distributed. And this graph, and what do you expect? And you expect scatter, random scatter plot, symmetric ar around line of zero. So line of zero is here. And 95% observations are uh, fallen between the range minus two, two plus two. Okay? So you do see patterns and variations are smaller in the, at the lower value of x-axis, but larger and higher value of x-axis. So this indicates variances are not equal. And then you see outlier here. This is probably due to A's observation. So when Pearson's correlation or simple linear regressions result differ from Spearman's correlation, what is likely happening is assumption for Pearson or assumption for simple linear regression is not met. Okay. And in this case, we will use non-parametric approach like Spearman because it doesn't assume any distribution. So we can trust result from non-parametric approach. But when you conduct multiple linear regression, when you have more than one independent variable, there is actually no simple non-parametric approach. So this is a challenge we are facing today. So what, should, what can we do when the assumption of linear regression is not met? There is no simple solution to that. And what Carcourt and Stern are recommending is as follows. One, check for mistakes in data coding or data entry which have led to outlying or influential observations. Two, sensitivity analysis with which examine whether conclusion change if influential observations are omitted. Three, use of transformations of outcome or independent variable. Four, ex explora exploration of nonlinear relationship between the outcome and exposure variable. Five, use of methods such as bootstrapping to derive confidence intervals independently of the assumptions made in the model about the distribution of the outcome variable. Okay. So this is a topic we are going to uh, cover in today's lecture. Let's start with number two. Okay. Sensitivity analysis which examine whether conclusions change if influential observations are omitted. So in this example we know A's was outlier. So let's exclude A's observation from this analysis. To exclude the data points you go to data, select cases, Okay, click on if condition is satisfied and if okay. and if this is equal so in this case not equal so that's this one not equal I think this is a string letters so you need a quotation mark here right. so if you look at and A is selected out. So all the analysis we are going to perform uh, exclude A from this point. So uh, what you do is you go to linear regression and then we perform this analysis. Okay. And okay. All right. So by doing this, and actually p-value became significant, right? And the beta coefficient is now 0 0.018. And let's look at R-square. Now R-score is 0.23, so it's 23%. Three so it's not quite there yet because PM ensured out R-square is 45%. So we have room to improve but we just improved our square from 1% to 23% just include just by include just by excluding AIDS observation use of transformations of outcome or independent variable 
A rhythmic transformation is by far the most frequently applied method in Kirkwood and Stern use of algorithmic transformation throughout the book. However, logarithmic transformation does not work when data includes uh, zero value. And in, in such a case, or when log transformation does not improve normality of residuals, I will show you uh, situations and when log, log transformation doesn't work. Uh, you may want to seek other transformation methods. There are many choices for transformations of outcome or independent variables, such as uh, reciprocal, 1 over x, 1 over y, square root, cubic root, and a square or cubic. And cubic root is actually a good alternative of logarithmic transformation. And let's first know more about logarithmic transformation. Okay, so log transformation work when data are skewed this way. We call this positively skewed data. So you have a cluster at lower value, okay? And whereas negatively skewed data, you have a cluster at higher value. And log transformation is effective when you have a positively skewed data. When you have a negatively skewed data, and it makes this skewness even worse. Okay. When uh, data are negatively skewed, and uh, you can actually transform using a power greater than one. So power of one is actually no transformation. So power of 1.5, power of two, and power of three, square and cubic would work. When you have a positively skewed data, and power of the value less than one would work. Um, so it could be cubic root, or square root, or log. Uh, log 10 and log e, and log 10 and log e, by the way, um, does not really change result in terms of p-value. So either log 10 or log e you can use for log transformation. Okay. So in, when you want to do cubic root or square root, uh, and in SBSS, and this is the expression you can use. Let's log transform outcome variable. Log transformation is, in fact, useful method to prevent bias by outlier. So uh, let's include A's back because it is better not to exclude any observations unless they, they are clearly by mistake. So uh, let's see if. Uh, log transformation solve an uh, issue of outlier, okay? So in order to remove filter, and you can either delete this column, or you can go back to select cases, and then click all cases, right? And let's log transform outcome variable. You go to transform compute variable, and let's give a name, LM. Uh, dollars. Okay, and if you forget what is a function to use for log log, log transformation, you click arithmetic, and here is a log. This is a log base ten, and this is a natural log. Okay, and it, either is okay, and let's just use natural transformation for now. And uh, okay, so put disability here. And after you do that, and you simply repeat analysis using log of dollars as outcome variable instead of dollars. So let's go back to lecture note. Right, this is a result of l analysis with log transformed outcome variable. So uh, p value for the slope is 0 0.025, and r squared in this case is 17%. Yeah, but as you see, uh, AIDS is not as outlying as um, non-transformed analysis. Let's try to interpret the result of this analysis in terms of beta coefficient. This means what does 
0.18 means. And there is 0.18 log dollars increase by one unit increase of disability adjusted life years, both due to um, illness. Right? And does that meaningful? It's not really intuitive. So it is advisable when you log transform outcome variable and you need to anti-log uh, beta coefficient. When outcome is log transform, you need to back transform beta coefficient. So in this case, beta coefficient is 0.183 and then you need to exp exponentiate 0.183 and which is 1.197. So interpretation of this become relative increase. And what is relative increase? And there is 19.7% increase in NIH funding for every $1 million increase in disability adjusted life years lost due to illness with 95% confidence interval. And 95% confidence interval is uh, similarly, you take exponential of this uh, lower and upper bound of confidence interval. Right? This is a graphical presentation of relative increase. So, um, expo exponential of minus 2.754, which is 0 0.0636. So starting with $0.636 billion, when adjusted life years increase by 1 million years, there is 19% increase in NIH funding. Okay? So that this is a 19% increase from $0.637 billion. And this point is another 19% increase from this point. And this point is another 19% increase from this point. Okay? And of course, when the value become higher, relative increase become higher. Therefore, this association is not the linear. Okay? Log scale, it was linear. But when you anti-log of that, and it's no longer linear. Okay? And here is a recommendation from Annals of Internal Medicine. Authors should transform coefficient into the appropriate measure of effect size. Annals of internal medicine using a logistic regression as example. Um, and when you log transformed outcome variable in linear regression, the similar concept applies. Okay? So remember when you do logistic regression, you exponentiate beta coefficient that translate into odds ratio. So in the here, we do the same thing. You take, we take exponential of beta coefficient, and that will become relative increase, okay? So let's check residuals after you log transform outcome variable. And residuals looks normally distributed now. And QQ plot, PP plot looks okay. And how about this one? Do you think variance are equal across the value of independent variable? I realize one thing. Independent variable, which you reflect as predicted value, and seems still skewed. Okay? So this doesn't directly link to violation of assumption. Although, when you have a skewed independent variable, it is better to transform so that independent variable is normally distributed. Okay. And that's often increased power of the analysis. So let's transform independent variable in next step. Let's log transform independent variable. You go to transform, compute, and instead of dollars, you change this to independent variable, this ability. Um, okay, and click. And let's make sure it is created. Yes, it is. And so next analysis, and we are 
we will use both log transformed outcome and log transform independent variable. Okay. All right. So now result p value become very significant. And let's look at r square, which is 41%. So this actually got very close to 45%, which we originally got with the Spearman's correlation coefficient. That was a goal of our analysis. So let's check residuals in this case. Go back to handout. And this is the residuals. So residuals looks normally distributed, and PP plot looks normally distributed. And now, independent variable is log transform, so that uh, it is relatively normally distributed. And we have one outlier, okay, but it's much better than um, it was before transformation. Okay. So. Um, so this is a graphical presentation of the result of log of outcome and log of independent variable. And for graphic for graphs, in I put both in original scale. Okay. So do you see improvement? Uh, so compare this to the linear regression that we performed very first. Okay. So here, what we did is using log transformation, and we actually did do nonlinear analysis. So linear in log scale is actually nonlinear in original scale. Okay, so that's um, this improved the fit of this model. This is a clinical example. Um, many variables in biology are often the, um, log normally distributed, which means after you log transform, and distribution become normal. And this is an example of uh, association between SaO2, FiO2 ratio versus PaO2 and FiO2 ratio. So uh, they are pretty much linearly associated in log scale. But after I anti-log both SAFI and PAFI, it becomes nonlinear scale. In next chapter, in we are going to try categorization of independent variable. And although it is not recommended by Kirkwood and Stone, and I don't recommend it either. Another popular method to deal with nonlinear association is categorization of continuous independent variable. For example, using percentiles. When you categorize independent variable, in fact, it is the same as conducting student t-test if you categorize into two groups. So you have continuous outcome variable in uh, two-level independent variable, or one way or another, continuous variable of three or more groups in the independent variable. Categorizing independent variable is severely, severely criticized for tremendous loss of information. And because you actually did know exact value of um, independent variable, but after you categorize and you lose that grand neural, grand you lose that information. It assumes a realistic stepwise function which cannot be explained by, by uh, explained biologically. Okay, so um, that stepwise function means this one. So this is a result of analysis you categorize um, based on independent variable. Okay? And you thought of compare mean of NIH research fund among three groups. Okay, so your predictions is the same 
within each group. So it doesn't really matter what is the value of independent variable is. Okay. And it, many people actually do this kind of analysis. So let me show you how to do this analysis. It's BSS, you're going to transform and run cases. So this will categorize independent uh, continuous variable into uh, into um, into tartar group. So let's say it doesn't have to be just tartar. You can do quintiles and you can do whatever. Um, so let's put the variable and it, we use disability adjusted by features independent variable and uh, you click on rank and then click end tiles and if you want to do tile tiles you just put three and then continue and okay. So if you go back to data set and then now you have instead of you have um, instead of having continuous variable and you have a three level categorical variable. Okay? And then uh, you go to uh, linear regression and then perform analysis. Actually in this case and you should you can do ANOVA type analysis, so it's actually easier to use general linear model and univariate option.